representative for COP26, uh, which Britain is continuing to run until the Egyptians take over in November um, for the whole year since, uh, since Glasgow in November. And I'm hoping, David, that you are joining us. Are you there? <coughs> David Moran, are you there? All right, well, look, while we're getting it, um, because Costas, the floor manager, did say that he is there, what I'd like to do is introduce you uh, to both uh, Maria and Michael. Michael, uh, you are Professor Emeritus um, of uh, Environmental Chemistry, uh, National and... Capodistria. Thank you very much for saying that, because I can't read it. It's, so, it's written so small here. And Maria as well. Introduce yourself as well, please, Maria. Well, Maria Fernandez Pinoza, former president of the United Nations General Assembly, former foreign minister and defense minister of Ecuador and a climate negotiator for the past 15 years. That's far better than the introduction I would have given you. And Costas, can we do something, please, about this sound, which is burbling <laughs> backwards and forwards and distracting us, the, the, the sound? Mm. Thank you. Let me just ask one more time. David Moran, are you there? David, I think I can see you. I can see you, but I can't hear you. I can see you, but I can't hear you. So stand by, um, and I'll talk to Michael and yep. Maria first of all, because um, we can't yet get hold of Yasmin Fouad. Uh, Maria, when you look at the enormity of what we're talking about, and notice your namesake, your namesake kept, kept saying, now, <coughs> now, Can now. It's got to happen now. And given what I was summarizing, I think maybe you weren't here when I said it, but what has happened with the working group two and the working group three of the IPCC in the last literally five weeks? Do you believe the sense of urgency has yet been accepted by governments and others? I would say we have the knowledge, we have the science, we have the technologies, we have the resources uh, to make it happen, to really comply mm. with our commitments under the Paris Agreement mm. and uh, what came after. We know, uh, we know that we need mm. to increase the ambition on the NDCs uh, and, and yet a few days ago the last part of the, of the IPCC report Working is, Group 3. Yes, is telling us we are off track in the mitigation targets. We are not doing it well. And unfortunately, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, uh, the new geopolitics of energy mm -hmm. is not going to help. And already now, all these pandemic recovery packages, uh, trillions of dollars, uh, we are seeing even the New Deal. Uh, the previous speakers, uh, speaker was mentioning a, in, in a very, in quite a, um, note of, of, of hope and optimism that we should not lose, as Patricia Espinosa uh, just mentioned. Um, the tracking uh, shows that 6% of the recovery packages uh, under the European Union are addressed to what we would call, we can call a green recovery or a just transition. But let me move this reviews. forward. The, the working group three of the IPCC says very clearly, we know the science, we know it can be done. We know there are ways in which technologically we can now keep within 1.5 degrees instead of going to 3.2 degrees. How do your, you, you, you have been in politics. How can this be communicated to people who've got to change their way of life? Well, I think number one is the will. And when we, we say we lack leadership, it's very important, you know, that we have leadership. Yes, we do need, but a shared leadership and co-responsibility is not only on governments, but it's on the private sector, uh, it's on citizens, uh, the global north, but also the elites in the global south as well. We have to dramatically and drastically and urgently change our high carbon lifestyles. But can that we be done in three years, which is what the scientists well, the, say? Well, the truth is that th this implies uh, and tells a change of culture and behavior. So I think that the behavioral sciences have a big role to play here. Uh, but we know that humans can change dramatically their behavior. The good example was COVID. In 
you know, in a couple of days, we understood that we needed to wear masks, <coughs> wash our hands, keep uh, social distancing very quickly. Why? Because our lives were threatened. And here is the same thing. The, the, the problem is that the chemical composition of the atmosphere cannot be seen by the, by the regular citizen, except for the victims of climate change that are mostly in the global south, in small island developing states, in low countries. So it is a, a social behavior, but it is also responsibility of the big emitters. Where is the money? That is my question. If you, but if you were still running a government, would you be saying, we've got to change before the next election? Absolutely. And I think the power of voters is extremely important. Okay. When you vote for a candidate, you should ask him or her, hopefully her, you know, to come up with a very strong and clear uh, uh, decarbonization uh, plan and project. The younger generations have to vote for the leaders that can, that, that are reliable, and they can trust, but they can deliver on low carbon development models. Because what we'd like to do is, coming from this w series of workshops this afternoon, is work out how things can be done at the speed that the science says has to be done. And for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, I was quoting from Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 from the IPCC. Both reports have come out within four weeks mm -hmm. of each other, which is remarkable. The science is desperate, though. The science says it's now or never, and that's what the message was literally two days ago. But what we need to do can be done if there's political will. Michael, let me pick up, because yeah. you're doing a lot of work on the Mediterranean, particularly. Exactly. And I want, to, I want to come to you about the practical realities of dealing with something like the Mediterranean, which you know, and you have also said to me, things are not moving as fast as they need to go, even though we know the scale of the problem. Yes. Uh, allow me to say that, apart from a professor, I chair the major federation of non-governmental organizations in the region, uh, the Mediterranean Information Office, and I have acted for 25 years as the representative of the European Parliament of the European Environment Agency. So um, um, this is also uh, what we have produced on climate well, hold change. Hold it up, can you? I you have to... I, I will hold it up. Yeah. Sustainable uh, I, Mediterranean and right. climate change. Um, so, the rapidly increasing challenge. Rapidly increasing challenge. Yes. So uh, allow me to, to say that it is not so easy what we said about that we know and we have. And I, all our groups discuss opportunities, and they are there. But tell me, when we try to implement them here in Greece, when we try to have uh, um, the uh, wind turbines and uh, put them somewhere, they are challenging biodiversity. We cannot have these two together. We have to find ways in which we can balance these things. And we sometimes have to move beyond national frontiers for that. For example, in the Mediterranean, we may have in Sahara something that could feed North uh, Mediterranean or even e the, the entire uh, European uh, region. Uh, we are talking about um, the, big uh, the, big, uh, the heavy industry of, of the Mediterranean. Where are you getting the resistance from, though? Picking up on what Maria was the saying. The resistance is uh, uh, people, but not only people, is knowledge. We see that we have to, at the same time, safeguard the biodiversity. Yeah, but, but if there's an urgency, and this is what is coming through from the IPCC, there sure. is an urgency. It's uh, urgency also, uh, Nick, from the biodiversity. And this is, we need, in order to be implemented, these things, we need from the beginning to go down and see how we can balance these things. Because otherwise we, we, we are still in silos. So we need, we proposed, for example, the WIFE approach, the water, energy, food, environment, or ecosystems approach. At the same time, when we discuss among the climate, of course, climate people are not only energy. So this is one thing that still we are weak.
I'm not saying that we don't have the means. We don't have yet the means to combine things in a way that the society would accept and run with us. Give, I, let me give you one more. The heavy industry yep, of the Mediterranean is tourism. How we can, at the moment, solve the problem without planes and, and ships? Are we ready to electrify this? Are we ready for that? So when we are saying we are ready, we have to, to be honest with ourselves and our constituencies. I have difficulties with, we have billions of members, 130 for federations, national and others. All of us want to move fast. Let me put with that one phrase from Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, two days ago. He actually said in a very undiplomatic way, you were at the, the General Assembly, but he actually accused governments and businesses of saying one thing and doing something else. He said, they are lying. Is this something you're both facing uh, when it comes to understanding the enormity of science and what has to be done, Maria? Nick, just for one moment, think about countries like my own, Ecuador, that are highly dependent. Sometimes 50, 60, 70% of their GDP comes from oil exports or gas exports, okay? And they have to take, you know, the hard choices. Uh, they're middle-income countries, most of them. 70% of the, of the membership of the UN are middle-income countries. They are really between a wall and a hard place, as we say, because they know what they need to do, but at the same time, they don't have the fiscal and the policy spaces to do what they need to do. And it's but not that they- But using the word lying, coming from the Secretary General, who you used to work with, actually using the word governments and companies lying about what they're really doing. Well, I would say that we need to understand what are the structural hurdles of countries, especially when we are not seeing clearly where the money is coming. And the money has to come from the wealthy countries. Not only the money, but the technology transfer, but the capacities, the intellectual property no. flexibilities for low carbon technologies, and the need to really decouple the right to development, growth, to high carbon investment. And the other part of the, of the, of the equation here oh. is about fighting inequalities. All right. Now, you need to fight poverty. <laughs> Countries, especially in the global south, they really need to, to address the issue of, of high inequality, but we need to come up with compensation mechanisms, with financial mechanisms that would provide right. this policy and fiscal space. Let, let me open this up in a moment, is, but is again, Michael, let me just put me? to you, are you Zerifos. facing what, it's not my word, it's the UN Secretary General saying, in a very undiplomatic way, that with the scale of the challenge, and he said, literally, uh, four weeks ago, he said, um, a damning indictment of failed climate leadership people on the planet being clobbered by climate change, half of humanity lying in the danger zone, many ecosystems at the point of no return. Is that what you're facing here in the Mediterranean? It is true that we have double language. Let me put it like is that. Is double language the same as lying? Almost. 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 Okay. Because it's different. It's the Delphi it, definition is of lying, di it, double it, language. It's is, is different, different with different audiences, if I may say so. So the issue is uh, this. But let me give you an example. For Greece, for example, at the moment, is committed to move fast for renewables. At the same time, we consider also extraction of uh, fossil fuel from the sea. And this, you have to see it in a different way. If we use these deposits, it could be a game, a change game in the region, geopolitically. So you cannot say to, to any government that you have to forget altogether about that. So you see what I mean, it's not a lie, it is Double language. Well, to a certain extent, uh, is the same language, but the emphasis 
is different when we have different All right. audiences. My, but Michael here and we Maria, have someone who knows much better. Right, <laughs> Michael and Maria, stand by for one moment because for those of you who've been here for the last hour, you can see this is a very moving feast. And you can see that up there, we've now got three other um, figures who've joined us, as well as here. Uh, and I'm assuming uh, that, uh, that exactly, Costas, I was about. I, I, was, I was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but this is an evolution which is taking place. But most important for the moment, if I may say, is on the left of our screen there, who's David Moran. David, welcome. Um, we know you've been struggling to get a connection. And the reason we're struggling here is because we were expecting to hear from, uh, from Egypt, from the Minister of Environment, who's running COP27 at Sharm El Sheikh from November. But COP26 is obviously still very much uh, under the British presidency, driving forward uh, progress. Now, David Moran, welcome. And I'm going to introduce the other two of your colleagues who are sitting there on the screen in a moment. But why we've asked you, and we are now on time because we, didn't, we do not have the, uh, the Egyptian minister. What I'd like to hear from you, David, as we discussed beforehand, is your assessment of where the COP26 process is. Because, to put it bluntly, um, the kind of language we have been seeing since Glasgow six months ago, uh, which is being confirmed by Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 in the last five weeks, is pretty damning. And you'll have heard what the... Um, what the, uh, the Secretary General has said. Now, you being a British diplomat won't use the same language. And we've got from Michael here, I hope you were able to hear it, the idea that lying is actually double language. But I'm not asking you to comment about a, a, a political leader or the leader of, of the United Nations or the, the most senior figure at the United Nations. What I'd like to do is hear from you in a few minutes. What is your assessment? What kind of guidance can you give us six months on from Glasgow as to whether the kind of spirit of Glasgow, the ceiling of Paris, is, is, is contributing to a significant move forward because the evidence doesn't seem to be as optimistic as certainly Alok Sharma, your boss, has been indicating in the last three months. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, and I hope, I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, excellent. I think we always recognised that it was going to take uh, 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 you know, the full president of the year to reach, to reach the potential of Glasgow. Glasgow set up... We, we cannot hear, I'm sorry. We, we cannot hear. But um, we have to turn those promises into action. And that, that's what Aaron Sharma has been telling us. Uh, the sound level is too low. During uh, 2022, we'll work as closely as we, as we can with uh, Egypt to help them deliver vicious summit. But what we need to do now, nearly halfway through the uh, COP26 presidency, is to work with everyone, all of the actors that have been referred to, uh, you know, governments, business, local governments, uh, civil society and individuals uh, to, because it's going to take all of us to, to bridge the gap and, and the gap is tremendous uh, the, the IPCC's three invaluable reports uh, leave no doubt that there's a very uh, short time that we have to take ambitious action, and everybody's been saying this, so I don't need to 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 uh, repeat too much. But the window is closing, and uh, we can't delay at all. But if this urgency was recognised in the Glasgow Pact, of all countries acknowledged that emission without target didn't go far enough. That's why there was a request in the Glasgow Climate Pact. Uh, requesting everyone, all four countries, to revisit and strengthen 2030 MEC targets in the country to align with the Paris temperature goal by the end of 2022. And uh, we've, we've heard from IPCC's latest report uh, what uh, the, 
the trends are lending to, e even if um, all countries, 2030 pledges at Glasgow are met, warming is likely to exceed 1.5 during this century. So we should be actively reducing emissions immediately and half them by 20. And countries who haven't submitted an enhanced NPC could do so as soon as possible, particularly major emissions emitters and uh, and all countries should look closely at what more they can do ahead of the next UNFCCC uh, updated synthesis report before, before COP27. And, and just to comment on uh, uh, energy prices and current events. Maybe a need for some short term imperfect measures, but the crisis doesn't change anything about the imperative to tackle uh, climate change and impacts uh, robustly. And that is uh, something I would emphasize alongside the doability. It's, All right. not, it's not easy, it's not really straightforward, but it's absolutely the case that it can be done. But it, it requires a massive transformation, as we've already been outlined, involving all the actors and uh, removing, as far as we can, technical and financial constraints, explaining in simple terms what needs to be done so that those who are not climate aware or don't understand the implications of what they're seeing outside their windows when it's well. Make the connections and provide the support which is necessary for, for robust action and action in level. David, um, I'd like to stop you there because we're struggling with the sound, but we've heard your message. So if you can just be patient. Um, and I'm going to repeat uh, a number of the things you've said, and please, please dispute if I misheard them on the rope, ropey sound connection. The gap is tremendous. We have a very short time for action. The window is closing. Must actively reduce emissions immediately, which backs up what Working Group 3 said on Monday. And we need a massive transformation. Have I heard you correctly? Yes. Excellent. OK, well, that's a relief. Uh, Zoom has worked at, uh, as far as um, your, your, your audio is concerned. Now, what I'd like to do is come, if I may, um, and apologies for not having seen you in the audience, but I was rather reliable, re relying, <laughs> Costas, on, uh, on who was here. Yeah. Now, we are now back on schedule. Okay. And what I'd like you to do, Costas, and, um, is you've got a microphone as well, and I'll come yeah. to the the two other participants sure. who've, who've joined I, us, but I want to come to you first. Okay. Costas, what, what is your um, understanding of where we are? Do you believe, uh, do you support the IPCC report? Well, I can't believe you'll disagree with it. As the chairman of the Scientific Committee on Climate Change in Greece, do you, do you believe that the very sharp and harsh message scientifically is being understood by governments and corporates who, according to the UN Secretary General on Monday, some of them are lying about what they're doing and what they really intend to do. Okay. Uh, I cannot talk about all the governments in the world, about you know, how much uh, they are lying. But I you think can give an impression. The, the, uh, the, the message is very, very clear, and it comes at a very critical moment, given uh, the, war in, uh, the war in in Ukraine. I think the, uh, uh, I will isolate from the entire message the fact that it can be done. Yes, we are running out of time, but um, it can be done. And you For believe example, as a scientist it can be done? I believe as a scientist it can be done. I think the European Union um, has gone through extensive studies, uh, both in preparing the European climate law, uh, which is uh, minus 55 by 2030, uh, net zero by 2050, and also within the Climate Council of Greece, we've uh, seen studies that uh, make it quite clear that if uh, we take the right measures, yes, indeed, we have to start now, but it is entirely doable and financially feasible 
to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Do you believe you have political support for that view? Because uh, we were talking to Maria about that, yeah. about the fact that it's all very well saying it can be done, but it requires very clear political messaging. I think right now the, uh, there, is there is political support. Um, the problem is, of course, um, I mean, and this is the story of the climate law. The, pro the problem is um, with, the, uh, with the war in Ukraine and uh, also with the prices, with the price of energy. I think uh, I wouldn't say the support is waning. I do think that uh, you know most European governments are fairly sincere and do understand you know the issue. The question that we have not been able to address very well as scientists is if we delay, let's say, by two years, by three years, what are the consequences? We know right now that, I mean, and all the studies that we have are based on 2018, 2019 uh, data. I mean, you know, all the stuff that we have. If we delay by another three years, if we don't take action by, um, I mean, what we're supposed to do, are we still going to be on target by 2030? I think this is a really, a really big question. And I really think this is where, as a scientific community, we should focus. Yes, it's absolutely urgent. And there's no question that we are going to fall in the short term behind in our climate ambition. But I think what is happening in the Ukraine is going to expedite very, very much the development of green energy. You may not have been in the room when I quoted this an hour ago, yeah. um, but I, made, I, I tried to summarize what happened from Working Group 3. But this from uh, lead author Helen de Konig, uh, who's at Eindhoven University, quote, mm -hmm. we have to peak our greenhouse gas emissions before 2025, 2025 yeah. then reduce them rapidly. Right. You've just talked about two years, and we're two years away right. from 2025-ish. What do you it, say to her? Because if, if it's another two-year delay, that... Absolutely, absolutely. But on the other hand, we have to be, um, you know, as a scientist, of course I want to do it before, and of course we have to peak by 2025. 20, but the reality, but the reality for, for governments is that, uh, and I'm glad I'm not in government, is that they have to balance many different other propositions. And the question is, uh, the, no, the, the, the issue that we really have to address is, uh, yes, convince them that it has to happen now, no matter what the cost is. All right, well, I want to hear from all of you how sure. you convince governments to take the regulatory measures, mm -hmm. to introduce what is necessary, to in, 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 introduce the imperative. But let me go to the other two yep. guests who've joined us. Christos Serafos, who's Secretary General of the Academy of Athens and the Climate Envoy for Greece. Welcome, Christos. And also Petteri Talas, who is Secretary General uh, for the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO. And uh, Petri, you, of course, made a big contribution to working groups two and three, and we've seen you in the press conferences and so on. But can I first, uh, as I'm in Delphi at the moment, uh, go to Christos? First of all, uh, Christos, just pick up on what we heard from Costas about the imperative of action now, because the scientists make clear it's got to be done now. It can't wait two or three, four more years. Uh, I, I'll go to your question, how to convince the political leaders to take action according to Costas' suggestion. Uh, <clears throat> I think they, they know that the cost of doing nothing is very high. For Greece, we have estimated at the Bank of Greece, at the study, that the cost cumulative at the end of the century is up to 700 billion euros. Billion. If we adapt, that cost is reduced to about 400 billion euros. These are large numbers and they have great effect in the, in the balance, of, in, in, in the annual balance of, of, of uh, every country. And uh, like in Greece, uh, similar numbers and larger are the costs at other neighboring countries. So I think that's the best way to convince uh, politicians to take the right decisions and do them, take them as promptly as possible. Um, I would like to point out the fact that, uh, as you said, WMO has uh, been taking a lead role uh, 
in uh, all aspects of, of that adventure of humanity, which is uh, the anthropocenic uh, uh, or man-made climate change of the past uh, few decades. We can see the effects, we can see the costs. Now, uh, there have been some statements uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday by the, uh, the, the State Department in the United States and by the President of the United States that the costs are going up. And the coincidence, unfortunately, of the pandemic together with the war that we have in our neighborhood, uh, they all add to, together uh, to impose solutions that we, we, we wouldn't think about them. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what uh, uh, the governments are going to do with the uh, dependence of Europe on the Russian uh, fossil fuels. And uh, uh, this is something that may delay somehow the decisions which were underway. The European Union has been always in the forefront uh, <clears throat> in the case of uh, climate change. Now, going to our dear friends and colleagues from the United Kingdom, uh, the uh, I, I, I would like to parallelize uh, the, the Montreal Protocol, which was uh, at a turning point in uh, 1990 when there was a large conference organized by uh, Thatcher and uh, uh, most of the countries were hesitating to implement the decisions that have been proposed in the Montreal Protocol in 1987. Now, um, the, the conferences uh, which uh, followed uh, the London Amendment uh, Conference in 1992, we were very lucky to have the eruption of, of Pinatubo, which accelerated the destruction of ozone, a different story, but it's parallel that it has accelerated the decisions. And uh, I remember that there were only 35, 40 countries who have signed in 92 and after the eruption, because ozone has been seriously depleted. Uh, after that eruption, everybody rushed to go and, and sign. Today, we have 220 signatories. So can I, can, could I interrupt at that point? Are you saying that what we need now, tragically, is a don't look up moment? In other words, <laughs> a moment of imminent catastrophe, which is going to mobilize yes. people. Many people in this, in this room are smiling. Some of them are laughing. But I think that I'd like to be interested in other people's reaction. But is that what you're saying when it comes to ozone, when it comes to the Montreal Protocol? Yes, I'm saying that nature, mother nature, protected the ozone layer because the decisions uh, have uh, been uh, 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 hesitating to go out and they came immediately. And All I right. think now it's time that we have to face that natural disasters, their number, intensity, their frequency, is going up. All right. We know that the poles, the poles of our planet, are person, overheated, and uh, the ice is melting. These are very bad signs to us as scientists uh, that uh, the destabilization of our climate will go faster and uh, harsher. All right, what I'd like to do is pause you at that point, if I may, because what we need to do is move forward, particularly on, in, in the next 50 minutes, how we make progress, how we actually make an, make, make an impact. And I'm going to come uh, in a moment to you, Petri, but I'd like to quote to you what Inger Anderson, who's the executive director of the UN Environment Programme said, quote, climate change is not lurking around the corners ready to pounce. 
It is already upon us, raining down blows on billions of people. We are in an emergency heading for disaster. We can't keep taking these hits and treating the wounds. Soon those wounds will be too deep, too catastrophic to heal. That's what she said on the record after Working Group 2, and she repeated something similar on Working Group 3 as well. So, Petri, can I come to you, because you've been deeply involved in the whole process of the WMO. What is your reflection? Because, um, and I, I, you won't have heard what I said right at the beginning, there are the scientists saying very clearly the challenge to stay within 1.5 degrees is doable. Otherwise, we're going to the head for 3.2, but it needs action immediately. What is your quick reflection, please, on what on the whole process, but then how you make public the degree of urgency? Because the tragedy is that both these working group reports would have made headline news, but because of Ukraine, they have not been seen at all. First on the 28th of February, which was day four of the war. Secondly, on April the 4th at the beginning of this week. Therefore, much of what we're talking about, even though it's an existential threat to all of us, is simply not even being debated. So, Petri, what your, what's your view? Uh, can we have the microphone? Can we have the audio up, please? Uh, we'll check at this end as well, Petri. Keep talking and then... Keep going. Petri, are you, you're, are you on mute where you are, or do we have a sound issue here? Let me tell you, I, I have been working in television for many years. What we're trying to do this afternoon is actually very ambitious. So yeah. we take Zoom for granted, but actually uh, organizing Zoom and doing this kind of thing is really tough. So hands off to the, the technicians here for making it work. Petri, have another go. No, we're... Nope. We think it's at your end, Petri. What I'd like to do is, if I can leave you offline for the moment, and then if, if Costas, the floor manager here, can signal to me when we think we have the signal back. Do you, are, you, are you up and running, Petri, or not? No, he's walked away. Okay, that's not a good sign. Right. He'll come back. <laughs> he's left a flag. He's left a United <laughs> Nations flag planted, so that's, that's a good sign. Of, uh... But can I pick up on the, on the question which we've raised already and we, we haven't fully answered? about the speed and so on. And Maria and Michael, you've been sitting here where others have contributed. Uh, and also what you heard from COP26 and the process there and the urgency. How do you believe that this can be, can be transmitted to a public? You've already partly answered this, Maria, but we need to understand how this can be transmitted to a public who, uh, we have to understand, are governed by governments who largely, even in Hungary, have to be, get re-voted in again not in, sure. in Moscow, but uh, therefore telling people that they've got to change their lifestyle, change the amount they use their car, change the amount they burn gas, and change, change just the basics mm -hmm. is not an easy political sell. So Costas, let me come to you first, if I okay. may, because you raised this. Okay, but uh, I would like to say that we cannot sort of uh, put it everything on governments. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, right. there is, I mean, the other, the, I mean, if we, if we, um, uh, if we suggest, and of course, I don't doubt the Secretary General that a lot of governments lie, but at the same time, a lot of companies lie, a lot of oil companies lie. I mean, this is a huge problem. I mean, the sustainability plans, I mean, you know, they, I mean, you know it sells, I mean, they have it out there. I mean, what is the scientific basis of all the claims that oil companies make in terms of getting to a net zero by, 20, by 2050? I mean, let's for a moment think about this because a great part of the, uh, you know, of the problem is, uh, I mean, we all know it's, it's fossil fuels. Certainly when it comes to, when it comes to Greece, energy uh, is about 30% percent of, the, of the problem. And uh, yes. I am pulling a lot of emphasis in terms of the change and an organic change that really needs to happen in the oil companies. Sure, I think, as I said, uh, in the medium term, in the long run, the Ukraine crisis is going to accelerate our green transition. But in the short term, unless you know, the oil companies, we bring them to bear in terms of the consequences, as well as the governments. I'm not taking the governments out, but I'm also bringing the oil companies. We are not going to have results, the results we want. Michael. Well, I, I think that um, 
a key are also the voters. And in order to have the voters, I mean, judging from people around the Mediterranean, different understanding in the different countries, and even in countries like Greece, where the majority understands the issue, is not a key decision made on climate. This is not at the top of their priorities when they vote. But they will see it as an economic sacrifice. This is true. And I, I think that uh, we need always a good crisis in order to educate people. And I think this is the moment. I think we have, and when I say we, not only academics, non-governmental organizations, institutions like the Academy of Athens, many other, not government per se, have to shape actually now the public opinion. And this is the right moment. But we receive at the same time double messages. When we have in the newspapers, and particularly the TV, the key solution on how we we'll negotiate about gas from other sources, we are up this bridge, natural gas bridge, has confused people a lot. Maria, how do you sell this as a politician? Well, I, I would like to, just three headlines. Headline number one, we have had 26 COPs, very soon 27. The number of, co, uh, of COPs is inversely proportional to the increase in emissions. What I'm trying to say is that the governance design we have, which I defend, I'm, I'm a pro-multilateralism, something is not working right. After 26 years, I think that we should have, you know, got our act together and it's not happening. I'm saying this because the issue of accountability, the issue of implementation is critical not only on the arithmetic of emissions, not only on the mitigation side, on the adaptation side, on the loss and damage side, on the resilience building side, on the climate, climate finance side. So this cannot be seen just an arithmetic of emissions. But there's a very clear shopping list on working group three. It's very detailed. It's an enormous document saying this is- Is what a, a needs to be done. But my, my worry here, Nick, and, and sorry I'm interrupting, Not is that we talk about we are reaching a point of no return. Let's think about the future generations. I say, let's think about current generations. Let's talk to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines who have lost 80% of their built infrastructure because of, of hurricanes and tornadoes. Let's look at the Lake Chad situation yeah. uh, in, 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 in Africa and see the millions, and I'm not exaggerating, the millions of internally displaced uh, persons and climate refugees because of climate. So it, it is not only about sacrificing the Western lifestyle, it is about the lives and livelihoods of people in the global south where the future starts today and started way you know, beyond today, uh, way before today, because they are experiencing, as we speak, loss and suffering because of climate change. Let me try the question, and I think, uh, Petri, you, you look as if you may be ready to go again, and you're nodding. I will okay, come to you in a moment. Now. But do you believe that the kind of extreme experiences which are being um, experienced in the developed world, like in California, like in Boulder, Colorado, where literally in 20 minutes, a thousand rich houses were burned down because there had been no precipitation for six months. There'd been a hurricane in December, and it, it literally destroyed what you've seen in the Eiffel district of Germany last July, Correct. what you've seen in other places as well. I would put to you, and we've seen it in our own neighborhood in London, where we had an extraordinary Singapore without the heat. Suddenly there was an enormous amount of rain and it flooded people's houses. And suddenly the people who go to, to their pinstripe um, jobs every day were saying, that's about me. It's not about polar bears anymore. It's about me. Do you believe, and you're nodding, I think, do you believe that that in its own way is going to have an impact on the political process which will lead to much stricter 
uh, a much more uh, radical, a much more generous um, or ambitious ways of tackling climate change. Absolutely, and I think we have to change uh, what we understand by na um, national interest. Uh, national interest is about the global well-being and the atmosphere should be seen as a global public good. It's about national security. Uh, so it is about security. And I think we should not uh, just ignore the impact that the transition is going to have because of the war in Ukraine. I think this is a major, major issue that is going to change the energy security architecture, in particular in Europe. And I believe, I hope I'm, I'm not I'm mistaken here, but when you, we hear that the defense and security budget is going to increase in Europe, let's hope that the, greener, the, the Green Deal and the transition is not going to suffer because of that. That was my second headline. And um, the third he headline, was the silo approach. I think that uh, what we need to look at here is how to interconnect the real conventions, biodiversity, desertification, forests Absolutely. and climate, and, and oceans together. And there is a, a formula that is out there. Let's hope that it would uh, you know, become a reality in Stockholm Plus 50 in June. But looking at an overarching framework, looking at planetary boundaries because what we are doing is really trespassing the planetary boundaries, not only of the atmosphere, but of our oceans, of our forest, our biodiversity. And I think this is an issue of lifestyle, but, uh, uh, and we have the opportunity now to reconcile with nature. Uh, I always say climate is not a problem. Climate is a symptom that we have a broken relationship between the economy society, nature, and politics. Well, the Desgupta report of exactly a year ago makes very clear that nature has been abused. And I think that's what came through very clearly in Glasgow. Suddenly, nature, it's understood that we are abusing nature. It is an externality that has to be costed now. That's coming through loud and clear. Would you mind if I go to Petri? Because Petri, I hope you, you're being very patient and I can see you nodding. Let's see if there's sound which goes with your smile. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. We've been saying a lot of things, so you can pick up, particularly uh, the role of the WMO, and there are things you probably can't, um, for reasons of discretion, share too much with us, but we'd love to hear more of the inside track of how dramatic you now believe this is from the World Meteorological Organization point of view. So, of course, we have now published these three parts of the IPCC reports, and, uh, and in, the, in this August report, we demonstrated that uh, that the negative trend in, in climate, the, the weather events will continue for the coming decades anyhow. And, and then, uh, since we have only exceeded the 400 ppm of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, uh, the, the melting of glaciers and, and sea level rise will continue for the coming hundreds of years or even coming thousands of years. And uh, that's bad news for, for many coastal areas. Uh, it's bad news also for the freshwater resource availability uh, since many big rivers worldwide have the origins from the mountain, mountain glaciers. And, uh, and, and what was uh, shown in this uh, two report, uh, which was published one and a half months ago, was that, uh, that the impact of climate change they are seen everywhere in the world, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and those events have become more intense, and, uh, and also the economic uh, losses have been growing actually five times since the two days. And, and, and of course, the smallest uh, countries like the United States, uh, they, are, they, are, they are suffering the most. Uh, for example, in 2017, Dominica lost uh, 800 percent of its uh, GDP in, in, in one day when hurricane was uh, hitting them, and two years before, they lost 250 percent of their GDP. Now, Petri, you, you, you've seen very, the, the, the masses of scientific document over the last five years. Are you convinced, um, you, have, you have signed up to it, but are you convinced that we can avoid 3.2 degrees mm. if we take the massive technological leaps that are necessary and for which the technology already exists if there is political and corporate will? So my question, building on what Costas and me, Michael and Maria have said here, uh, very clearly, are they prepared to run with what is now possible? 
can there be a significant change which is, makes this all achievable as opposed to something we'll be talking about at other conferences for the next 10 years? So what, what the, uh, the report that was published on Monday shows is, is that the prices of uh, solar, wind and, and, and uh, energy solutions and also, also the price of uh, electric vehicle has been dropping dramatically and they, they have become more affordable. And uh, what is good news is that the private sector has started moving and there's growing interest among the private sector to be part of the solution and, uh, and also it's a business uh, opportunity. The main challenge is, uh, is, uh, is in, in, in the so-called BRICS countries, uh, especially uh, to, to convert their uh, energy fleet uh, to be less dependent on, on, on fossil, fossil energy. And, uh, and it's a question how much uh, uh, the G7 countries could put pressure on, on, on those countries to, to speed up their, their process. And there's also need for technology transfer from uh, Western yeah, countries to, towards uh, countries like uh, India, and, and uh, most likely we have to build also more nuclear energy to comfort the huge energy need that we have in, in for example, China and India. But uh, we are no more heading towards five degrees warming, which was the worst case scenario from the previous IPCC report in 2014. So things have already been happening, and uh, with the past 15 years. Uh, 32 countries have reduced their emissions and at the same time their economies have been growing. So, so it's doable, but uh, so far we are not heading towards the Paris, uh, Paris uh, targets uh, as we all know. I, I mentioned that right at the beginning, um, certainly as, as part of the introduction to this, what is it becoming a very extended workshop. But uh, let me ask you about, about you as the WMO. I can't reveal who the kind of people I've been talking to have been in the last 48 hours, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that there are voices of anxiety that actually this report, because it had to be a consensus report, has been watered down to the point where the science is credible, but actually the scientific reality is even worse than was put into this Working Group 3 report. Is that your view as well at the WMO? So this uh, uh, the acceptance process of this working group three report was uh, delayed uh, because of uh, uh, action of uh, especially Saudi Arabia and, uh, and India. On Sunday morning, only only uh, ten percent of the content was approved, and uh, by the evening on Sunday, uh, it was uh, eighty percent was approved, and by Monday morning they were able to get everything uh, finalized. Uh, but it didn't change the main message of the. Of the report, there were some uh, some wordings that were, were, were this debated, and uh, there were sometimes uh, footnotes put by those countries that they are not uh, in line with uh, scientific statements. But it's this is a scientific report, and, and these political views uh, uh, basically do not change the contents of the report. But they, that means that uh, the processes are delayed, and and, 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 and certain. Facts need to be debated, but, uh, but it's, it's based on science and, uh, and, and we cannot uh, say it's to science. But do you at the WMO actually believe that the state of the science is even worse? It was c confirmed in the document on Monday. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, of course, uh, you, you who, are, who, who is coming from media, you, you like uh, sometimes a little bit horror stories and, and there's a small fraction of the uh, science community which likes also to tell these kind of uh, dramatic stories. But I think that the contents of this report and also the previous uh, working group two and one reports, uh, they are based on solid uh, science and, and they are based on, on, on uh, material that has been published in peer-reviewed uh, journalists. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a voice of science and, uh, and you cannot uh, debate. All right. Petri, for the moment. Now, um... Right, I'm told that uh, our minister from Egypt is not joining us. So, for those of you who have joined and wondering what you've walked into, you've walk, you walked into a, a rolling workshop where anything can happen at the moment. And um, <laughs> <laughs> where anything can, anyone can come onto the platform almost, yeah. and I'm going to invite you to join in as well. Yeah. Um, so, we're being flexible. And maybe if we can see as well, Kostas, could we see the three guests, including uh, Christos and uh, uh, David, because I, what I'd like to do, we're going to keep this running until 4 o'clock. In other words, we have 
33 minutes, and I'd like to engage anyone from the floor as well. What we're looking for is very clear messages of how we can take forward the possibility of reducing our consumption of greenhouse gas emissions at the speed, at the vital speed, that the uh, inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made clear very, very sharply uh, in its report on Monday. So please put up your hand and Chris, uh, uh, Costas, if you can make sure we have a microphone. I'll come to you in a moment, but I just, David and uh, Costas, I, want, I wasn't able to see you at any point during the interventions we've just been having. So can I just ask you, D David, uh, representing COP26, we're not gonna hear from Fuad from COP27, so uh, you've got it all to yourself now. Is there anything you'd like to add and reflect on? I'm afraid your sound quality was marginal when we last heard from you, but is there anything you'd like to add quickly about where in the next six months before Sharm El Sheikh in November, you and uh, working for Alok Sharma, the president of COP26, believe you can still take it, even with Ukraine, even with all the geopolitical pressures on governments at the moment, which is another existential threat. Uh, help us understand, I mean, you, you work for the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, so you're a, you're a diplomat. Help us understand where this process can go within the limits of diplomacy. Over to you, David. Uh, we're we're struggling with your we're struggling again, David. Can I just check you're not on mute? No, okay. Um, I'm not sure who to look at here. Okay, um, we'll try one more time. I want to get, make sure you feel you've had your voice heard. Thanks. Uh, I I I, I heard someone breathe. <laughs> <laughs> David, try again. Right. Well. Okay, can you, can you hear can me hear, now? We can hear you now. I'm just going to underline, look, I've been in television for many years. Doing this on Zoom is really, really tough. Um, it, you can do it sitting on your, at your study at home, but doing this in a public setting is really tough. So every sympathy and understanding, please, for uh, our, our technical colleagues. David, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with much of what's uh, said, uh, and very eloquently, too. Um, one thing I, I think we don't need is a new crisis. We face so many challenges already. Uh, we, what we really need to do is, as I said before, is work to make the connections to what people are experiencing already and, and what they're likely uh, to see in, in the coming months and years. And that, that means really clear messaging uh, from uh, government, but also non-governmental, and also listening to people, uh, including from small, uh, small island states, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable countries, mm -hmm. peoples, uh, and young people who often have uh, the clearest of visions. Uh, there, there is a consensus to be built, but there'll always be challenges, and we need to be ready to, to, uh, to challenge back and say uh, that moving quickly towards the net zero targets and acting uh, immediately to reduce uh, um, emissions are the right answers for all of the questions posed to us, including the current crises. There's, there's also a risk of people feeling uh, a sense of helplessness. Uh, you know, the challenge is too, is too big. I think it is important, as many people have done today, is to underline it's doable. It is doable. Uh, it's, it's not easy, but there is uh, momentum underway. There are people already making headways. You, you see it in, in cities. Uh, where, uh, where good results can happen fairly quickly. Uh, and, and you hear it uh, in some governments who have shown a good degree of ambition while also uh, achieving economic growth. So it's, it's doable. We need to keep saying that it's doable and the benefits are there and the costs of not doing so 
are very high. Now, let me ask you about uh, what, one thing you said there. We face another crisis. We face a crisis. And I mentioned the don't look up moment coming. Could there be a don't look up moment coming? Um, not a meteorite, but something s similar. And we've seen catastrophic events in growing proportion of growing gravity in too many parts of the world, both in the developed and the developing world. What do you mean by face a crisis? Because I'm doing all this work on thinking the unthinkable. And much of what mm -hmm. we're talking about here, here is not unthinkable. It's simply unpalatable. It's okay. going to happen. Sure. Uh, w what I'm saying is we have a rolling uh, series of extreme weather events. Uh, and even with those, uh, people can conclude that it's out of the ordinary. That if it's not a one-off, it's a two-off or three-off. It, the challenge is to join the dots and say, this, what you are seeing, is the impact of climate change. And this is why everything that has been prescribed by, uh, by the scientific analysis uh, is necessary. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, we heard you much more clearly this time, so thanks for being patient. Let me just pick up. We've got 25 minutes to run. Maybe our agenda here is too narrow, and I'd like you to broaden it or come in with not political statements, but real pragmatic suggestions. A former president of the General Assembly, uh, we've got uh, an emeritus professor here, we've got the Climate Change Committee of Greece, we, and also our three guests um, beaming at us from the, the monitor there. Please introduce yourself. Of course. Uh, uh, are you going to speak English or Greek? Uh, English is good, I think. Okay, good. Because I need to switch I'm on sorry. a head headset. Introduce yourself and... Of course. Uh, first of all, it's great to be with you here. Uh, my name is Todoros Kondroyanos. I'm an investigative reporter from Reporters United, uh, a Greek investigative uh, team of journalists and of Investigate Europe, a European uh, group. And I have a question and I would like to hear some clear language from the scientists. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you talked before, and it was very interesting about the double language we have in uh, politics. And I want to hear the, the clear language of the scientists about the, the fact that after the, the, uh, the invasion to Ukraine, we have the revival of the oil and gas extraction programs in Greece, onshore and offshore, in a country that was never a big producer of oil and gas. Uh, in the era of climate crisis, you talked about we should have a peak in three years, and now Greece is planning again to find and extract uh, hydrocarbons uh, onshore and offshore. Is it that possible? And what's your opinion on that? It, it's happening in several countries, actually, yeah. including the United Kingdom. Would anyone else like to put anything on the agenda? Um, I, please, yes. Hello, it's a great honor to be here, and your uh, panel is uh, really impressive. Um, it's amazing to do, hear... Do introduce yourself, please. Introduce yourself. My name is Thanos Belelli. This is from Simprexis team, a Greek consultancy on sustainability. I am coordinating a panel uh, later on in the day with uh, major uh, corporations. I have a very straightforward... You are, need to ask them whether they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Quoting the UN Secretary General. Yes. I, I will. I have learned a lot from your uh, panel. I have been here from moment one. I have a critical question. As you understand, I'm obviously on your side uh, 100%. But we are in the middle of, of a war that will not finish soon. We have energy shortage, uh, food shortage. We have a uh, program, uh, problem with uh, migration, which is of unbelievable size. Uh, do we really care about uh, sustainability and climate crisis? Or are we talking about a um, scary future that is not tangible in our everyday realities while war is? Like uh, certain oils have tripled their prices at the given time. But the fact that the temperature will rise at this rate in 20 or 30 years appears to be too far away. What is your opinion well, on look, this? Well, I don't, th I don't think I need, really need... Please, if anyone would like to answer this, may I answer that myself? It's not me saying this. It is very clear from the IPCC this is an existential crisis for the planet. There's no... You can't avoid that. You can disagree with the science if you want, but the scientists have been made it very clear. I'm going to put in one rider here, though, which is, I think, deeply concerning. I come from the United Kingdom. We've had something called a Brexit problem. Uh, and one of the key people, one of the key people, 
<laughs> Don't draw me on that one. <laughs> one of the key people involved in leading that campaign was Nigel Farage. He has decided to change the Brexit campaign to an anti-net zero campaign. Oh, God. Thank you. Oh, With, God. And there are MPs who are now members of parliament. We're hoping to hear from the business secretary, the United Kingdom business secretary, in about an hour from now, Kwasi Kwarteng. I'm not necessarily going to put this to him. But there are politicians who now see votes in being against net zero. Even, if the, even though the science is saying it. Now, I'm just putting that on the agenda. Things are changing. Things are changing in politics in, I think, what are dis very disturbing ways. Does anyone else want to come in on that particular point? And then we'll go to this particular point about reinvestment in, um, in hydrocarbons. Michael. Well, two things. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, it is very difficult to ignore the pressing uh, issues at the moment. And uh, uh, this is a discussion for parallel solutions, always. So this, I believe that uh, it will be hypocrisy that we expect that uh, governments will think only about climate change when they are in front of this kind of pressing But do you agree that this is an existential crisis for the planet? Absolutely. Does anyone disagree with that? Uh, and and let, me, uh, let me say something on that. Uh, I believe that we need more alliances. This is why I'm saying that the security, the climate security, should be placed in a tetrahedron, if you wish, of water security, energy security, food security, and ecosystem security. At least these four, together with the climate, will allow not to speak about separate silos. Silos will be there, but the channels will increase among them. Good. And this is, for me, it is very important to be discussed in the two next COPs of climate change and of biodiversity. Costas. OK. I'm sorry to hear about uh, the UK, because there will always be people that are anti-everything, just like <laughs> you know, the anti-vaxxers, and one of the things that we have not done a great job as scientists is to really convince everyone about the importance of science in our daily lives. The reason I'm raising that, not because I come from the United yeah. Kingdom, is that there are those who see political advantage Absolutely. now in fighting and challenging the principle of net zero. Of course, because, I mean, these are the people that are anti-everything. Anti but, you know, coming back to the, uh, coming back to the, to the, to the problem at hand, uh, you asked earlier, and there was this question, uh, let's say, geopolitically, I mean, oil, gas in Greece. If there's a company that believes that, I mean, if we have a horizon of 10 years, by 2035, we're not going to be using gas in the Greek power plants, hopefully, at the most by 2040, which company is going to go out and invest? Actually, they, they, are not, they haven't even found deposits. They're going to go out, get them, uh, do all the development, and then exploit them only for 10 years? You know, this is, uh, you know, if a company thinks that they can make money out of this, what, uh, what can I say? Uh, but I want to take a different, a different tack for a second. Uh, I do, I do, on one side, I said how important it is to hold industry, and particularly the oil industry, to bear. At the same time, we should not underestimate, and I think this is the time to tell everyone what we can do as individual citizens. And this is something that, I mean, in this entire discussion, we tend to leave out. I mean, well, let's put the it on the agenda for the last 20 minutes, please. Okay. What do governments need to do? Okay. What do governments need to do? <laughs> uh, obviously, this uh, I mean, uh, provide you know huge incentives for uh, you know the you know the just uh, you know the just transition in the um, uh, and incentivize <coughs> to, a, to, a, to to a large extent. At the same time, I really think that uh, the economy should put a huge premium on companies that do not cooperate. How did we end up, for example, by, uh, by analogy, with the tobacco industry? I mean, people knew for 50 years now that smoking is extremely hazardous to your health. Sure, it was not an existential crisis. It was not for everyone. It was only for people who smoke. 
yet it took almost 50 years to come to the point that you know, the, there is a, the people who smoke are a tiny minority compared to the people who don't smoke. Well, why, what did it take? It took a lot of, uh, you know, in some, in some cases, governments punishing uh, you know, tobacco, the tobacco industry, but it was also the consumers and, you know, and everyone. I mean, there was a huge movement not to invest in the tobacco industry. Another example was, you know, in South Africa with, uh, uh, with apartheid. I mean, the whole movement around the world do not invest you know, in South African companies because they're supporting apartheid. I think this is another part that really needs to be done. I mean, at an individual level, uh, at the economy level, and the, you know, the people not investing in companies that are not, do not have clear, uh, clear sustainable plans, uh, you know, for the future. But the brutal reality is large numbers of hedge fund investors and others are making an enormous amount of money by yeah. investing in hydrocarbons at the moment, yep. even if they are going to be stranded assets eventually. So this is where government, uh, government uh, well, dis stick, disincentives stick, come, stick come around, in. Stick around for Kwasi Kwarteng because he believes in free enterprise. I mean, assuming he, he, he joins us from London, okay. he's the business secretary. Of the United, and I'll try and put that to him. Okay. Uh, Maria, and I want to know from uh, Petri and also uh, Christos and also David, if you want to come in, can you just raise your hand? because um, otherwise I can keep going round, but there are other questions in the, in the, in the audience. Well, I, I would l like to, to go back to your mismatch between narrative and action, you know, without saying the verb <coughs> lying, but uh, just a, a few numbers to share with you. The U.S. coal-fired power generation was higher in 2021 than it was in 2019, and in Europe, coal power rose 18% in 2021, its first increase in almost a decade. The G20 countries spent around $14 trillion on economic stimulus measures during 2020 and 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but only 6%, 6% was allocated to cut emissions. That is, you know, the harsh reality that we are facing. And this was before the war in Ukraine. So what to do, what to do? I would say that uh, I always think from the perspectives of, of countries like mine, about 50% of our GDP come from oil exports. And you see that the prices of oil and gas are just going to the sky. Would you say, you, and you are a highly indebted country, you don't have fiscal space, you need to pay your doctors, your, your teachers, uh, the, the public services, what do you do? What we are witnessing, it is not only Greece, it's the world basically you know, looking at how to expand oil and gas production. And of course, if you expand production, there are the buyers, the demand side as well. So this is going to, to make the decarbonization commitments you know, very difficult, not only for the wealthy countries, but also for uh, the global south countries that are highly dependent on oil and gas in their export matrices. The solution is not like uh, 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 easy, no, but I, I say that uh, the, the issue of collective responsibility, of uh, climate litigation processes, we haven't discussed that, but it is happening, you know, uh, bring countries, you know, to courts. It happened in Germany. Now there is a group of lawyers at, uh, organizing an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice. Uh, the, the Constitutional Court in my, in my country uh, you know, made a historical decision uh, against uh, mining, for example. Um, so the, the litigation side is important. The planetary boundaries uh, uh, interconnected global framework is important the individual, the citizens, the voting, and the consumer are, are important. And the sense of intergenerational responsibility, I think, is also important. Uh, I, I, I'm always thinking, you know, when I went to the Lake Chad area, you know, how irresponsible we have been as a species. You have called, Nick, over and over again to the sense of urgency. But I think this is also a sense of of uh, self-preservation, 
It is unbelievable that humans are not calling to our own sense of preservation as a species. Because the planet can live very well without humans. But us humans cannot Absolutely. live without, uh, without the planet. So uh, I think that stronger frameworks for accountability, for transparency, the role of the private sector is critical. 80% of the investment in the coal sector uh, is private. It's not the countries, but also the role of cities and local governments that we haven't addressed today. They have a critical role to play. It's very clear in the work, Working Group 3 report. Yeah, absolutely. The, the absolute sub-national, that doing things from the bottom up as opposed from the top down. Absolutely. I mean, 60% of the emissions come from cities. So I think that that's also where action needs to happen. It has to happen at the household level, at the local government level, because of the sense of you know, the, 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 the law of subsidiarity, let's say, at the government level, but at the multilateral level. We really need to be serious about the commitments uh, we, we make. And just, I, I use these two numbers on the G20 uh, stimulus packages, but also on what is happening in terms of coal consumption consumption in, in, in Europe well, Let me go to Petri US. now. Petri and uh, Christos as well. Uh, picking up on this discussion, where does the action need to happen now? Because Maria has just put correctly on the agenda where there's much more potential in some ways for action, which can be from the bottom up or the middle starters of society. Petri, where are you at the WMO thinking there is the chance of the most effective action, given the enormity of the challenge and the urgency? I think that this energy transition is, is clearly something where we have a big uh, potential in. And, uh, and, and, uh, and as, as I said, uh, this solar and wind energy have become affordable. And, and then we also need uh, to have uh, nuclear energy as part of, the, part of the cocktail. And in transport sector, of course, the electric uh, vehicles and hopefully in the coming years also hydrogen based the technologies will, will become available. And then we have to stop also deforestation. We are often blaming the developed world only, but if you look at the most recent IPCC report, it shows that uh, deforestation has had a major impact uh, uh, in Latin America, Africa, and Southern Asia, and okay. that needs to be stopped. And that's uh, also related to our diet. Uh, we, we, we have been cutting those forests uh, to, to, to feed the cattle, and, and we need soybeans for the for feeding of the cattle. So also this. Uh, uh, reduction of uh, use of meat uh, is, 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 is needed, but uh, but but I think that we have plenty of these low-hanging fruits as the as the working group three report was uh, showing, and, uh, and and things are happening, but so far unfortunately too too slowly. Christos, what's your view? Well, let me tell you a few things that uh, I believe are important. First of all, the deforestation that Petri mentioned before, I think it's of utmost importance. And that will be the next, when, uh, could I just say, that will be the next session in here in a few minutes. So we're going to go into detail in a moment. Go ahead though, I just wanted to point that up for, for our guests here. If, if, you, if you let me to finish up, I would appreciate it, thank you. So uh, the deforestation is indeed important and it, I was sorry that in Glasgow, the deforestation agreement signed by more than 100 countries, which is very welcome, it will start being implemented after 2030. Why not from now? Sharm el Sheikh could correct that. But uh, mostly I would uh, summarize because I have only a few seconds to, 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 to speak about my position. Uh, I would put one word, education. Education to all ages, to un people to understand the critical point that we are in our planet. Not everyone understands the critical point of our planet. Nobody and not everybody understands the importance of uh, the poles that are melting, the ice caps of the earth are, are melting fast. Nobody appreciates the heat waves in Canada and Siberia, what signs give us. 
So these things are, are being presented also by you, Mr. Convener, um, as a, as a well-known journalist um, in the best way. And uh, Sir Attenborough is uh, doing his best and uh, David Morton and all, all these people in the panel. We are all trying to convince the governments. Now I will finish with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, you know, the earth can feed us all, but cannot satisfy all inhabitants in this planet. Unfortunately, our change of uh, mentality and way of living, our change towards renewable energy resources that are everywhere and we don't use them. Uh, these are the things that should be included in any educational program everywhere on that planet. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't forgotten that question from the middle. Um, and we have literally about uh, six, seven minutes, but each of you, uh, or those of you who want to intervene, that question about uh, the guaranteeing supply of energy, and the way to do it is now uh, exploitation of new wells, new drilling, partly funded by the fact that gas and oil are so expensive, about whether in principle and ethically this is the right thing to do, to ensure economic prosperity or economic activity which can survive what is coming down the track because of the Ukraine crisis. What kind of views do each of you take about the, the real tension here between the need to keep an economy going, but the need as well to reduce the consumption of hydrocarbons at the pace that Paris expects? Michael. I think that um, we have to convince <coughs> governments, and this is difficult because we have to convince the entire parliament on that, that they have to go to the voters, to the public, and explain that they are not going into further exploitation of fuel, which is a hard decision, short term, for the benefit of the future. It is something we have as uh, people, as scientists, as uh, opinion leaders, to, s to ensure the governments, but also the political parties, that they have to go to the people with this hard reality. Well, let me check with each, each as well. Petri and uh, Christos, would you like to come in? And David, if we can hear you, I hope. Do you want to come in, David, on this particular issue? Do you, do you take a view as representing the presidency of COP as to whether, because the United Kingdom is facing this dilemma, there are many of the oil companies who are prepared now to reopen wells in the North Sea as a way of reducing the pain from the gas and oil prices. A quick view, please, from you, David, and then Christos, and followed by Petri. Right, well, as I said in my uh, introductory comments, uh, there may be some short-term emergency measures which are required, but it, it doesn't change the, over, the imperative. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you have to think about timelines. You know, standing up new capacity, uh, building new fossil fuel capacity um, will only come on screen far after, uh, far, uh, you know, long after the immediate crisis is over. All right. I mean, you do need uh, an energy security, a proper energy security planning process. But first and foremost, foremost, it needs to be built around renewables and, if necessary, some uh, transition uh, transition fuels, but the transition needs to be very, and it needs to lead to green. Thank you, David. Uh, Christos and Petri, can you keep your remarks quick, please? Uh, Christos, do you, do you want to come in quickly? I fully agree with David. He has covered me. 
Thank you. Petri. Personally, I believe that there's going to be a peak in consumption of uh, fossil energy during the coming couple of years. But thereafter, yeah. I, I believe that we will, we will speed up this green transition and, and, and people are more eager to buy electric cars and, and also this uh, renewable energy and, and nuclear energy build up is, uh, is going to happen. That's my personal belief. Maria. I would say that there is a fundamental difference between the right to development and living with dignity uh, as opposed to greed and overconsumption. And I think that we need uh, really to look at the injustices and inequalities that are embedded in the climate discussions. Uh, and I would really uh, make a, a call for, for a value-based, um, ethics-based uh, climate action. And um, when we talk about climate finance, let's be serious about my, making sure that the poorer countries have access to climate finance, both for mitigation and adaptation. And we, we have to explore perhaps uh, you know, creative ideas like uh, debt for climate swaps. We need to explore uh, creative ideas, such as using the principle of, uh, of um, um, how you say, precautionary principle in climate, compensation for not doing. Ecuador has a, had a very interesting proposal. We don't have the time here, but and to look at climate and the atmosphere as, as a common good. I think these co uh, common by share, uh, but differentiated responsibilities have to be part and parcel mm -hmm. of the decisions we take. Costas, last word from you, representing the Committee on Climate Change here in Greece. Okay, I will um, I will address the issue about um, what's going to happen now with uh, all of this plans to reopen wells, etc. I think one mistake that we make as we talk about climate neutrality for 2050 and we look at different pathways, we have not passed a very, very clear message. Let's say by 2035, no fossil fuels. By 2040, no fossil fuels. Can we do that as a scientific community? I think there is a lot of, we are confusing people in terms of saying we have pathways going to 2050. We need to actually, and governments need to pass a very, very clear message because I think the zeroth order effect is fossil fuels. We can worry about whether we eat meat or, mo or, or, mo or not later, but if we pass a clear message about not using fossil fuels beyond a certain date, I think this is going to, in a way, reboot our economic plans. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick test. You're, it's a total unscientific um, <laughs> sample, of course, but who believes here that government should be very proactive in telling people exactly what the challenge is and exactly what they need to do in changing their behavior and mindset. I'm going to ask, first of all, who believes that that's not a good idea? Who believes it is a good idea? There's an overwhelming consensus from the Delphi Economic Forum. <laughs> all, all 50 of you. You, it's you, a bit like you can use unanimity. unanimity. Yeah, we have unanimity. <laughs> Report that, please. <laughs> anyway, look, thank you very much. We're only pausing for a moment. Thank you for your stamina, your patience, your understanding. Um, I think it's been a very rich debate, even though there's been some interesting technical challenges, non-appearances, but other, other appearances. Can I thank everybody for their forbearance and patience with me and also with, with the audience. Don't go away, do have a coffee or something, but we are gonna be talking about forests coming up. Um, uh, that's gonna be chaired uh, by uh, Spiros, uh, who's going to be here. But I'm hoping to be back to uh, talk to the UK Business Secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, about, who believe, who's a, an advocate of free enterprise solving all these problems. I hope he joins me from London in about an hour and a, a bit. So please don't see this as the end of an endurance test. It's merely a staging post. Please come back. Take a break. Thank you.